I taught Sunday school, okay? Ernest Cannon, this mean, fierce lawyer, was in my Sunday school class. And when they found out at Fulbright and Jaworski, they decided to put me on every Ernest Cannon case they had. They figured he was less likely to screw his Sunday school teacher than he was someone else. They were wrong, but that was their reasoning. So I got assigned the Ernest Cannon docket. Now, Ernest tries cases like TV. Um, Boston Legal, uh, James Kirk, um, uh, Denny Crane, Denny Crane. Denny Crane is a wannabe Ernest Cannon. So I'll tell you one of my war stories now. This has warmed us up. I was told, Lanier, Ernest Cannon has filed a lawsuit against McDonald's. We represent McDonald's in this case where Ona Mae Clute drove through the Madisonville, Texas McDonald's, ordered her a cheeseburger, french fries, and a Coke. Ona Mae Clute drove home, she ate them, and within an hour started vomiting. Long story short, Ona Mae Clute within five hours, dead. Heart attack. The lawsuit was filed against McDonald's under the idea that eating that cheeseburger it probably had food poisoning in it. And it probably stressed her heart out because the vomiting was part of the food poisoning. And she has a heart attack. Now, it doesn't take Dr. David Eagleman back there to tell you that the cheeseburger may have, in, yes, him, he's a doctor over at Brown, and the cheeseburger may have, in fact, been part of a killing heart attack, but it was not that one cheeseburger. It was the hundreds of thousands she'd eaten all over her life. There was no food poisoning. The key to a good food poisoning case is you got to have a bunch of episodes. In other words, not, not one hamburger gets food poisoning. It's going to be a group of hamburgers. So you're going to have 20 episodes of food poisoning at the same McDonald's who ate the same meal. That's the way we identify. You know, people come to me all the time, I got food poisoning at the restaurant. Really? How many other people got food poisoning? Nobody. Well, then you had a stomach virus. Sorry. Go home. Um, but he, he had to bring this lawsuit because Ona Mae Clute, Ernest had grown up in Madisonville. This was his home county. And Ona Mae Clute had a severely retarded son who was about 21 or 22. His name was Carrie Clute. And she had left him um, um, when she had passed away. He was in a state school and uh, um, Ernest was going to ride to the boys' rescue. So Ernest sued. The, I left out part of the story. There was a doctor she went to see over the vomiting. He said, Ona May, hunting season starts in one hour. I ain't got time for you. He shoots her up with some Thorazine, which is a tranquilizer, and says, if you're not feeling better Monday morning when I get back from the hunt, come tell me. So he sends her on her way. Unfortunately, he only had $100,000 in malpractice insurance. So he's not a good target. We got to get Carrie Clute, the retarded son, more money than that, Ernest figures. So what Ernest does is he sues McDonald's. We represent McDonald's. I get the case all ready for trial. I go get the experts. I take the depositions. I go through all, I've got it all mapped out, but McDonald's won't settle. So Ernest takes it to trial. Now, 95% of cases settle without trial, but this is the 5% that don't. So we go to trial in Madisonville, Texas, and me, Mr. Sunday School Teacher, who's been working so hard on the case, I become Mr. Briefcase Carrier at trial. I'm a second, third year lawyer. They don't let me go into the arena against the feared Ernest Cannon. So we have a partner who does that. His name was Otway Denny, a wonderful lawyer, a great trial lawyer. So Otway goes in and I'm carrying his briefcase. I don't really speak out at court. I just carry the briefcase and do all the grunt work and do all the work at night and tell him what all is there and what's not there. The case unfolds. The jury's been selected. The jury's in the box. Twelve jurors in Texas, in Houston. I mean, Madisonville. Twelve jurors in the box. Ernest has packed out the courtroom with 300 local people. Now, the whole town only has a few thousand, but 300 of the town are there. Totally packed out, standing room only. Ernest gives his opening statement. We give our opening statement. The judge says, call your first witness, Ernest. Ernest says, Your Honor, I call Carrie Clute to the stand. Now, Carrie is the mentally retarded boy, 21-year-old boy. Carrie stands up. 
muffled tones among the jurors. <laughs> As the court leans forward and says what all of us knew, including the jury, Ernest, Kerry can't testify he ain't mentally competent. This is in a small town in Texas, and they use ain't and can't. They rhyme. <laughs> he can't testify he ain't mentally competent. Ernest, oh, judge, I ain't going to ask him algebra or anything too hard. The judge, well, okay, Ernest, but keep it simple. Get up here, Carrie. So Carrie walks up, and, 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 and Carrie goes, oh. And I don't mean to make fun of him with this affectation. It's part of the story, and it is the way he talked. Oh. Judge, Ernest, I can't understand him. What's he saying? And the jury all looks because they can't understand him either. Ernest says, I think he's saying oath, Judge. He's seen this on TV, and he knows he's supposed to take the oath. Okay, I'm going to give him the oath, Ernest. And so uh, uh, Kerry goes, or the judge says, raise your right hand. Kerry goes, Bible, Bible. Ernest, what's he saying now? Jury's looking. Ernest, uh, judge, I'm pretty sure he's saying Bible. He's seen this done in, on TV, and, and he takes the oath on the Bible. And, you know, on TV, it's the way they do it. Judge says, Ernest, I ain't got a Bible. Just tell him to take the oath. Ernest, oh, judge, the memory of this may be the only thing this boy gets out of this case. And he looks at the jury like, <laughs> you going to give the boy something more than a memory? <laughs> Heaven knows his memories aren't that hot. Then Ernest looks back at the judge and he says, let me just see. Ernest turns around to the packed out courtroom of 300. Anybody out there got a Bible? Lady on the back row, Miss McKenzie, third grade teacher for Ernest, and almost all of the jurors, stands up. I do, Ernie. Big old black Bible. She waddles down the aisle. Ernest reaches into his pocket and pulls out a wad of $100 bills and says, just loud enough for the jury to hear, uh, thank you, Miss McKenzie. Can I pay you for this so I can give it to that boy? It may be the only thing he gets out of this trial. <laughs> she says... <laughs> She says, just loud enough for the jury to hear. As she puts the Bible in Ernest's hand, she reaches up, pinches Ernest's cheek, and says, Honey, you're doing the Lord's work. You give that boy that Bible. He deserves a lot more than this after what McDonald's did. She turns around and walks back down the aisle. Now, I'm sitting there just wide-eyed thinking, we didn't cover this one in torts, but I'm loving it. All I can do is remember the TV line from my, civ, uh, my criminal procedure professor. So Ernest uh, uh, hands the Bible to the judge. Judge says, Carrie, put your, uh, put your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand. Well, Carrie does it wrong. Ernest, the judge says, no, Carrie, that's the wrong hand. Come on now, and fixes it. Just reaches out there and fixes it. So Carrie's got it right. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, self you got? I do. All right, Ernest, keep it simple. Ernest says, are you Carrie Clue? Yes. Do you know Ona May Clue? She's my mother. Tell us about her. She loved me very much, but I don't see her now because she lives with Jesus. Pass the witness. Well, we did not have any questions of this witness, so Carrie left. Now, the trial proceeds for several weeks. Closing arguments come, and Ernest has kept that big old black Bible on his corner of counsel table right in front of the jury the whole trial. Closing argument, I've said nothing the whole trial. I've sat there dutifully carrying boxes and briefcases and writing notes and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. The uh, closing arguments, Ernest stands up, he gives his liability argument, you know, here's why they're at fault. And then Ernest goes into the damage part of the argument. And in the damage part of the argument, Ernest says, now, ladies and gentlemen, lawyers aren't very good at talking about damages when it involves the value of a human life, because lawyers generally just value money. And oh, if she'd been a million dollar executive at McDonald's, lawyers would say, oh, it's a million dollar case. But lawyers don't think that women who don't make that kind of money, they don't think they're worth anything. 